I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Kara Cooney as our third lecturer on Egypt in our Global Speed Lecture Series this year. Dr. Cooney is a professor of Egyptian art and architecture and chair of the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Cultures at UCLA. She's a leader in research into funerary and burial practices in ancient Egypt, including coffin reuse, and she's traveled around the world to study and document more than 300 coffins. Her 2014 book, The Woman Who Would Be King, Hatshepsut's Rise to Power in Ancient Egypt, is an illuminating biography of its least well-known female king, one we'll hear a lot more about tonight. And Dr. Cooney's latest book, When Women Ruled the World, Six Queens of Egypt, was published in 2018 by National Geographic Press. And tonight we're gonna to hear about someone very famous, but not well known enough, the woman who ruled the world. We know that women rule the world, but they have rarely been given the throne to sit on. Almost no evidence of successful long-term female leaders exists from the ancient world in the Mediterranean, the Near East, from Africa, Central Asia, or East Asia. Only the female king of Egypt, Hatshepsut, was able to take on formal power for any considerable length of time, and even she had to share that power with a male ruler. Given this social reality, how then did Hatshepsut apply her political genius and negotiate her leadership role? This lecture will work through the ample evidence for Hatshepsut's reign in an attempt to find the woman behind the statues, the art, the monuments, the stele, and the obelisks. Please join me in issuing a warm welcome from Los Angeles to Dr. Kara Cooney. Thank you, Dr. Cooney. Take her away. Thanks so much. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks, everyone. Let's go ahead and share my screen. Um, OK, so I have a lot to do and 40 minutes to do it. So let's, um, let's see how I can work through all of these slides. They'll come, you'll see one slide where I have six different women to talk about and you'll go, oh my God, that's a lot. <laughs> that's what I think when I see the slide. And, um, and we'll, we'll see how, how far we can get in 40 some minutes, but we'll have time for Q&A, save your questions, and um, we'll see how many of those I can get to. So this is just an introductory slide to tell you that I'm a, a bit of, um, I, I, I wear two hats. I, I serve two masters. I, I do two different things with my work. On the one hand, my more uh, intense research where I have to dot all those I's and cross all those T's is coffin studies. And that's me in um, the Museo Archeologico in Florence, looking at an Egyptian coffin and examining it for reuse. And that's the book that I'm working on right now. Uh, it's called Recycling for Death and it'll be an academic press that all of 500 people buy or something. But what I do, on the other side of this more academic work is I allow myself to muse and ask big questions with trade books. And I have two of these out. Um, the woman who um, would be king was my first one with uh, Crown. And the second one with Nat Geo Books, When Women Ruled the World. And I have a third one coming out called The Good Kings, Absolute Power in Ancient Egypt and Today, or in the modern day, something like that. We're fighting over the title. It won't be out until early November. So, the, um, the trade publishing has, it's, it's been a really wonderful way for me to take ancient Egyptian data sets where you have the same language, the same religious structure, the same governmental structure that spreads over 3000 years to take all of those ups and downs and all of that data and apply it within that time period, but also apply it to other um, times and parts of the world to really get comparative with this material. And, um, and, and thus to see what Egypt could potentially teach us about what we're doing with our systems of power, how we allow women into power or disallow them from power. And, and that will be the subject of our discussion today. So Hatshepsut will be a part of it, but so will Nefertiti, so will Cleopatra. This will very much be a discussion of why did the ancient Egyptians allow women into power so regularly and so systematically? Why don't we? and what could we potentially learn from the ancient Egyptians. So this is, uh, until recently, our reality of political power in the United States. And I don't think the patriarchy has left us yet. If I put a different shot up of the United States Congress, we would have a higher representation of women 
but that representation would only get to about 30%, not 50%. Um, if feminism is just expecting that half of the population have half of the power, then we are a long way from that. And this is this, this hostility towards female power, these issues with women and rule, these ideas that women are duplicitous, that they're somehow lying to you about what their true motivations are. These are things that are very interesting to me. And whatever side of the polit political divide, and it is a divide right now, you happen to be on, I think most would agree that in the last uh, 10 to 20 years of American politics, it's become pretty clear that the outright lies of a man can be regularly forgiven, whereas the woman is um, seen as manipulative and duplicitous even when those lies cannot be demonstrated. So it's, uh, it's um, interesting to see ourselves um, in uh, systems of power that we think are so modern and exceptional and are just like everybody else in the world. This is something I love to do. I love to break down our exceptionalism, our modernism in the modern world. And I like to break down the fetishized walls that we build around the ancient Egyptians and say, no, the, the Egyptians were like us and we are like them and we share many things. That's why the book that I'm writing right now, The Good Kings, pretty much starts with, so you think you don't have a king? Okay, let's discuss. <laughs> and so it goes, it goes from there. But uh, so back to our topic at hand, which is women and power in ancient Egypt. How did they get it? Why did they get it so regularly? What, what is this situation about? And the first thing that we have to focus on is a map and why Egypt is so very different. And that would owe itself to its place in the, in the world, in this northeastern corner of Africa that protects Egypt from all sides. It's got deserts on two sides, a sea to the north, a sea to the, the east, and it's got cataracts, big giant granite boulders to the south to even block that artery that connects the whole. So it is connected to itself internally, but disconnected from the rest of the world. And until the rise of ancient empires, empires like the ancient Assyrians, Neo-Babylonians, Persians, Alexander the Great, Rome, until then, Egypt really got to run its own system in a, in a very regulated way, a very safe way, without a lot of people invading from the outside. And in a place where the Nile provided a rather regular and very fruitful uh, supply of wheat and barley, so that even if you weren't really rich, you could be pretty full and drunk most of the time, which means that there wasn't a lot of internal competition either. These are broad generalities that I'm making, but if you compare Egypt to other parts of the world, compare Egypt to Greece or Rome in the ancient times, compare Egypt to West Asia, and the lack of competition internally is striking. And it is so striking that we have to focus on this idea of divine kingship that only exists in Egypt. This, this idea that, uh, let's use a little bit of a story, say the king dies before his time unexpectedly and he leaves a 10 year old on the throne. Well, I am here um, uh, parenting my 10 year old who was in the house and let's hope he doesn't break down the door and come in and disturb my public lecture, which has happened too many times before. But do I want that 10 year old ruling all of my country after the king has died? I know how a 10 year old acts. Only in Egypt do you allow the 10 year old to become king. Only in Egypt do people bow down and say, oh, he's the golden Horus. This is the way it has to work and they figure out a way to let that king rule. In other parts of the world, that 10-year-old would probably be dead before the week was out, maybe with internal strife, maybe an uncle is, is the one who, who kills the kid, maybe somebody's raised an army from the outside and the kid doesn't know how to rule on his own, maybe a combination of both. But it is an unusual thing in other parts of the world that are not Egypt to have a, a child come to the throne and to be protected. So that's, that's an interesting thing. What does this have to do with women in power? Well, Egypt is risk averse and they understood that if they were gonna put a kid into power, that they needed to make sure that that kid's power itself was protected. And if you're risk averse and you know that there's competition for this kind of power, competition for the throne, then you're probably not going to ask the dead king's brother to make the decisions on behalf of this 10 year old. You know you don't want the 10 year, 10 year old to rule. I know I don't want my 10 year old to rule, but you need somebody to make these decisions who is reasonable. 
If you ask a man to come in and do it, you're inviting trouble. We all know this, that if you ask a, a man to come in, he's going to potentially take that kingship for himself, move the child to the side. He's a weak and vulnerable child. You don't need to worry about it. So the Egyptians invented something that we Egyptologists call the queen regency. And dozens upon dozens of times, females were allowed to rule on behalf of their sons and to be the chief decision maker informally. So the kid's enthroned, put all the hats and the crowns on him. His mother has the incentive to make sure he grows into his kingship, that he becomes strong. She can't take his position, at least not easily, as a mother and as a woman, unless she has less incentive to compete directly with him. I'm not saying that women can't compete, but in a system that is a patriarchy in which women generally aren't allowed to take the throne, they, they don't try it as much because the ask is too, it's too high an ask. So the women who rule on behalf of their sons do so for a short period of time, and then they melt back into the shadows. What they had informally remains informal and their son stays on the throne and, and becomes powerful through their rule, their tutelage, their protection, all of these things. Now, I hope that you're seeing a little bit of the dirty underbelly of what it is I'm telling you. I'm telling you that Ancient Egypt allowed women into power more regularly than other places. We're asking why that is. How could that possibly be? They didn't do it in Greece or Rome or West Asia. China is a place where they did do this. What makes Egypt different that allowed them to bring women into power so systematically? And it is their unequal social system, their pyramidical social system of authoritarianism in which one family is meant to rule and if that family is in any way threatened, king dies before his time, young child comes to the throne, they're going to circle the wagons, that family. And if they need to put a woman into power, they will do so. So the more authoritarian the system is, the more likely I would argue that a woman can find her way into power. There's, a, there's some caveats here, which are, which are interesting. And I would say the more authoritarian the system is and also not militarily run, but rather family run, dynastically run, that's where the women find their power. So as Egypt moves into the Ramesid period with Nefertari and Ramses II, Nefertari is not a great woman of power, she is just a wife because Ramses II is embedded into a militaristic authoritarian system rather than a family dynasty. You could even compare Mubarak's Egypt where Suzanne Mubarak had a great deal of power to Sisi's Egypt in which it's a militaristic army and, and police structure, and the women have much less power in terms of family power in those systems. So some basic um, general points. Now, in this discussion, I'm not generally going to use the word queen for a woman who reaches the highest level of power as ruler of state. I am instead going to call her a female king. And that may, come across as pedantic or difficult for some of you, and you may be thinking, well, why is she doing that? Just use the word queen, this is annoying. I am doing this, I'm saying female king, because the Egyptians use the word female king to talk about these women, to talk about Tawasret or Hatshepsut. And so because they refer to them as king, I'm going to do the same and then add the little T's and the little gender markers that make these women female versions of the golden Horus or of the son of Ray. they'll be the daughter of Ray things like that. So here's that slide that I was telling you about, the six women that we will barely find our way through, but we'll do our best. These women were the ones who reached the highest levels of state, who were able to rule from the very pinnacle of power in ancient Egypt. Only five of them became king outright. The first one, Merneith, was buried as a king, but she's not called a king directly. I'll go into that evidence in, in just one moment. But the others all did reach that highest level of state. And those are the five female kings that, that we'll be following. This story is very complicated. And one of them, and you can try to guess which one, I will just yell out Game of Thrones and then I will move along because I can't discuss all of the details of complicated civil war, internal competitions, um, a, a young foster son with a club foot. It's extraordinary how um, interesting it is, but um, we won't have time for her. So. Let's move on to Mernaith of Dynasty One. Mernaith's tomb, when it was discovered in the late 19th century, was thought to be a king's tomb. 
And it's in a lineup of King's Tomb at the Sacred Royal Cemetery of Abydos. So you have a King's Tomb, another King's Tomb, another King, all in a line, all marked by these stela with different names, names marking the king. They find this tomb and they're like, okay, we got another King's Tomb, here it is, and here's the stela. And they look at the stela and they go, but wait a minute, something's a little bit off, something's a little bit strange, and they compare it to other king's names, and they notice that one particular thing is missing. And well, maybe two, if, we're, if we are being pedantic, and that would be the Horus bird, the hawk at the top of a structure, and then the structure itself is missing, this mud brick crenellated structure, that's the palace itself. So the hawk is standing upon a palace facade, the thick mud brick walls that would have surrounded his palace enclosure to keep the unclean masses out and to keep his space sacred and clean. This stela of Mer Nath, and that is the name that's on the stela, the one who is beloved of the goddess Nath, lacks the palace and lacks the Horus bird. So now the Egyptologists that, who are working here are like, well, we've got something different going on. What's actually happening? And not long after they found this tomb, they found a tiny little ceiling attached to a commodity in a later tomb, the tomb of King Dem. And on this tiny little ceiling, which is about this big, I've never seen it in actuality, I've only seen line drawings of this ceiling, they have a king list. And you see the kings marked by the Horus bird, and you see their names underneath. You see Jer, you see Jet, you see Den, and then I hope you can see a vulture, and that vulture is the sign for the mother. And there we have the answer to our conundrum, the answer to our problem. You see the, the plant in front of the vulture is a sedge, and you put those two together, you're the king's mother, and then Mare Nath, the one who is beloved of the goddess Nath. And so you understand, okay, Mare Nath is the king's mother. She falls between Jet, her husband, and the father of King Den, and then her son Den. So this is how she's going to come to power. King Jet dies too early. Something went wrong and they put a child onto the throne. Let's imagine he's 10 years old. We actually don't know because this history is 5,000 years in the past and to even try to write history that's 5,000 years old, it's actually stunning that we can say anything. We can talk about names, that we can, that we can give any sort of emotion to the story is extraordinary. And this is why I love Egypt. But what must have happened is that Jet must have died too young. They put Jer, sorry, they put Dan on the throne, and Mernath is then asked to be queen regent. And the circumstances that, that come along with this are very interesting indeed, because at this burial ground of Abydos, the Egyptians engaged in human sacrifice. This is a, an interesting topic, a topic of some contention amongst Egyptologists, but I would say that most Egyptologists do agree that human sacrifice occurred in the hundreds during this time period. And so this tomb of Jer on the Abedin plain, the, the sacred site of Abydos, would have been the location of interment. Um, it's two locations, but, but about 600 souls would have been, in, would have been encouraged to kill themselves with, with uh, some sort of a poison or they would have been strangled to death. The markers of death are not clear. But they, they all would have been interred around the body of the king. They would have been, received a little stela with a, their own name and maybe their title. And, and they would have served the king in the afterlife. And the idea is that these people were not poor. They were not enemies. They were not foreigners. They were from the king's court. And it was considered an honor. It was considered a, a, the duty of, of men and women to go into the next life with their king. Now, this may have been Mernath's father, and if this is the case, even if it's not her father and she's, she's an important court woman, she was probably there watching people die before her eyes. One of the mourners who was watching their own family members die before their eyes to make the burial of the king that much more important, to make the mourning surrounding it, the keening and the wailing that much louder. She probably would have been there. She also would have been there at the burial of her husband, maybe brother, King Jet. When Jet was put to rest, some 400, 300, 400 souls accompanied him to his tomb. And many of those souls were women, but many of them were um, young boys and also men. And here's the interesting point. 
Mernaith is married to this dude, right? So, and when he dies, he's the one that dies after too short a time on the throne. It's when he dies that the 10 year old is chosen. How that happened, we do not know, but this young kid, and he, I don't know if he's 10, but that's our imagination for right now, is chosen, is placed on the throne and Mernaith is selected as the decision maker. Mernaith is the one deciding at this moment who is going to live and who is going to die. She's going to be saying, you, you are a threat to my son's rule. You are a threat to my son's rule. And it's an interesting thing that, that Egyptologists have looked at these tombs of Jer and of Jet and have determined that Jer had more females accompany him into death. Whereas Jet, his, his sacrificial victims were more likely to be women with children, probably sons, and uh, men, strong, healthy men, probably brothers or, or somehow competitors, considered competitors of the young king who is now on the throne. So Mernaith is a case in point to prove that just because women rule, it doesn't mean that anything is uh, more pacific or calm or less warlike. It means that when women occupy a position within a patriarchy, they will rule as they are expected to rule. And Mernaith is uh, called queen of blood in my book for this very reason. She is there acting on behalf of her son. Um, but a job to do first, right? He's, he's on the throne and she's going to make sure that the sacrificial victims of her husband each get a marker of their own. They each get a room of their own. The markers of death are unclear on their skeletons. It's very hard to say how these people died, um, whether they had a trauma to the, to the head, a trauma to the neck. Um, these things haven't been well studied and more work needs to be done on how these people were actually put to death and what the nature of this human sacrifice was. Um, I will skip that, it was too complicated. Now, Mernaith rules um, on behalf of her son, Den, until she does it, until at some point she steps back into the shadows. Uh, maybe she dies herself, but Den goes on to, to have the best reign of all of the Dynasty One kings. He's important. He's, he's able to expand the boundaries of Egypt. He's, it seems, um, able to grow Egypt's authoritarian power within his kingship. And when Mernaith dies, it is Den, her son, who decides we're burying her like a king. I want her burial between my father's and mine. And he puts them right in between one another. He orders the stela card for her with her name on them and confuses archeologists to this day with what her power was, how it was meant to be understood. She received sacrificial victims as well, which is pretty interesting. It means that it's not a time period of transition from one reign to another. So there's not that vulnerability at stake. And yet they still felt that she deserved these sacrificial victims. So she receives 120 amongst her um, burial sites. I'm trying to forward my, oh, there we go, thank goodness. Um, it's a little slow. So I don't know if my Wi-Fi is slow and I'm sorry if my sound is cutting out, but we'll keep moving along. So this is what her tomb looks like in the reconstruction. And here we have a king list from just a few reigns later. This is a typical pattern for all of these women, that these women are important in the moment to save the family dynasty, to make that link from one man to another man as a placeholder. But as soon as their time is up, as soon as they're gone, give it a few generations and they'll be removed from the king list. So we see just a few generations later, there is no more King's mother, Marinate. She is not there. And it goes from male to male to male to male. And we return to the ideal patriarchal system from whence we came. So that's Marinate's story. Now we move on to our first female king, Nefru Sobek. You might also have encountered her as Sobek Nefru. We don't know which element came first and I'm not gonna worry about it too much, but you can see that we're skipping over 11 dynasties as we move from Egypt's very first dynasty when kingship was brand new to the 12th dynasty. When kingship is, is um, wiser, older, um, more seasoned, figuring things out, this is, this is Nefru Sobek's royal dynasty. So Nefru Sobek of dynasty 12, she is a formidable woman. And if this statue that was unfortunately destroyed in an allied air raid of Berlin, if it's hers, 
then she was a fearsome presence to behold. She didn't suffer any fools. She knew how to scare people down if she needed to. This was a woman who understood her power and it makes sense that she could potentially be Egypt's first female king. Her grandfather was Simwasret III, one of the, the most fearsome of Egypt's kings of any time period, not just the 12th dynasty. He took on a fight with Egypt's elites in Middle Egypt and won. He also expanded Egypt's borders farther than they had ever been before. And her father was Amenemhet III, also pushing Egypt's heights ever higher. We are talking about the 12th dynasty at a time period of riches pouring into the country. Everything's going right. Everything's going well. And the kingship after Amenemhet III's very long and successful reign moves on to this very little known Amenemhet IV. And you see my question marks. We don't know who he is, what's going on with this guy. You can see the, the Sphinx itself looks kind of ugly and you don't know who is this man and what's happening. The reason we don't know a lot is because he didn't occupy the throne for very long. He wasn't a powerful king. He was probably the son of Amenemhet III. This could have been a brother-sister marriage. This is something that, that happened all the time in these authoritarian dynastic families to keep power within the family. And it seems that he and Nefru Sobek did not produce any heirs. Remember, Nefru Sobek's not gonna be his only wife. She may have been his great royal wife, his chief wife, but every Egyptian king is meant to have a harem. Every Egyptian king is meant to be able to populate the, the throne after them with many candidates. And there is no candidate after Amenemhet IV. How this could happen, we don't know, but the next king is going to be Nefer Sobek. Um, there are some ideas for how this could happen. And my suggestion, and I've already mentioned it here, is the possibility of incest, which we know happened in Egypt and which we know dynastic families, some of them well known to us in, uh, of European tradition. Um, it's a practice that is taken on board very, um, uh, regularly by, by monarchies in control to make sure that you don't have to worry about sons-in-laws and fathers-in-laws and, and having to share family and position with anybody outside. And this kind of incest can become so prevalent that you have a series of brother-sister marriages as you had in Cleopatra's Macedonian family or in the Habsburg dynasty, for example. And, um, or you could look at the um, World War I started by a series of cousins all um, uh, descended from, from Queen Victoria's. And, and um, th these things are interesting to be sure, but it could be the reason for Egypt's first female kingship. And that brings up another important pattern into how women become rulers. And that pattern is that there needs to be a crisis of some kind. You need to have something go wrong. The king's got to die too early there, or there's nobody there on the throne to take over after him. Something's got to have gone wrong. And then all of the courtiers and the priests, because women don't just grab power on their own and say, ha ha, it's mine. I don't know of power working that way anywhere in the world, ancient or modern. There needs to be an agreement. There needs to be the courtiers and the priests and the, and the people with high positions saying, yes, we want you to rule. And that's got to have been what happened with Nefru Sobek, that you have all of these people who are stakeholders who want to keep their power. And when there's a crisis and Amenemhet IV dies suddenly and unexpectedly, they're like, oh my goodness, what do we do? Okay, well, we'll just put the, we'll put the woman on the throne. She holds the, the, the sacred element of divine kingship from the family. She's the last beholder of it. And so they make her the, the female king. And you can see the elements of this on her female person, which they do not try to erase. This statue, though it has no head in the Louvre, shows her wearing a dress, shows her as a female, but it shows her with the striped Nemi's headdress on, on her person. It shows her tying the kilt of masculine kingship over her dress. So it shows a layering of kingship and it shows a very flexible understanding on the part of the Egyptians about who can become a king and, and who can't. So it's, um, it's interesting to see that she's allowed to do this. Nefru Sobek, fulfills another very interesting pattern of how women get and maintain power. This is something that we can see in our own political world today, and I'll give you some real world examples in a bit. But she does so through her father, not through her dead husband brother, if it was her, her brother. Let, let me make it more, um, more visceral to us. Think of the pushback 
and this is just within the party. So let's make it within the, the party of choice, within the Democratic Party. Think of the pushback against Hillary Clinton in the 90s when Bill named her as head of healthcare. She had no formal position. The only thing she's got is a connection to her husband and you have a peer peer relationship. Now think of the reaction within the party of Donald Trump appointing his daughter Ivanka also to a very informal position of working diplomatically with people and, and the son-in-law, right? But it's within a patriarchal descent of hierarchy. The father is there telling the people under him what to do. And within those um, interest groups, so amongst those stakeholders, people are like, okay, we're fine with that because it works hierarchically, it works patriarchally. It's the peer to peer where we really have a problem. Well, Nefer Sobek knew this as much as anybody else. So Nefer Sobek is like, oh no, no, I'm not in power because of my dead husband brother. In fact, we're gonna even forget that he exists. We're not gonna mention his name, not gonna talk about him at all, but my father, He's the badass king that you all remember, whose name you know. I'm going to connect myself to him. So she puts her name alongside his name everywhere. She, she makes sure that they almost look like a, a, a married pair, confusing Egyptologists to this day. But she makes sure she justifies her rule through her descent from her father. And she claims she is only doing this because the God asks her to do it and because her father has given her this descent pattern. We will see this with our next female on the throne. So our next female is Hatshepsut, um, and she is uh, ruling in the 18th dynasty. So we've gone from dynasty one to 12 to dynasty 18. And Hatshepsut's means of coming to power is similar and different all at the same time. It follows some of the patterns quite well, and others, it's, it's a little bit different. Um, Hatshepsut rules for a child who is not her own. And that is why she's probably able to take control alongside him as a co-king. So let's see how, how this potentially may have worked. Hatshepsut was a king's daughter. She was a king's wife. She was also a king's sister because she was married to her half-brother, Tutmos II. And the only thing she never became was a king's mother because the child that she had with that half-brother husband was a daughter, not a son. And so when her half brother husband died after only three years of reign and everyone's freaking out because they're like, well, who's gonna be king after this? We have a bunch of two-year-olds in the, ostensibly we're guessing, right? Ages are always difficult. The Egyptians aren't recording this, um, but we have a bunch of toddlers running around, who, none of whom are Hatshepsut's child, but she's the great royal wife and she's Egypt's highest priestess. She is the God's wife of Amun. She holds these very, very important titles but has no son. And so it seems that there's kind of a sweetheart deal created in which all of the courtiers and the priests and, and the stakeholders come together and they allow the Oracle of Amun, the God himself to choose the next king. How this mechanism happens, we do not know, but they end up choosing a boy whose name is also Tutmose, who seems to come from a rather disconnected family. He's not from an important family. His mother does not act as his regent. She's not there as his decision maker. It makes one suspect that the stakeholders are choosing a king from an unimportant family on purpose so that they can keep their sweet positions by keeping Hatshepsut as their main decision maker. So even though Hatshepsut never had a son, and even though they're in this moment of crisis where they don't know who's going to be king next, all of the stakeholders come together and they say, yep, we still want you to rule over us and we're going to manufacture a way of doing that. And a king is chosen to rule next, very, very young, who is not her own child. And that one step removed is probably all it takes for her incentives to change, for her not to work in concert with this child, to bring him up and then step back into the shadows, but instead to, to more openly compete with him and to take on what he himself has. And that is the kingship. So by... In the early part of her reign, during her regency, as she's acting as the decision maker for this kid from the ages of, let's say, three, four, five years old, up to the age of about nine or 10, and we, we're not exactly sure of the ages of this child, she's positioning herself. She's claiming that she's doing the kingship, even if she's not the king. She does that in this text here. Uh, she's, she's moving herself forward to, to be able to compete 
with this child. And it is a child, make no mistake. That's, that's the king who's on the throne. But we have to imagine that this child has an entourage of elders, of adults who are speaking out on his behalf and who are potentially in competition with Hatshepsut, even though she is the regent and decision maker and chief priest and all of these important things of Egypt at the time. But in year seven of Tutmos III's reign, for whatever reason, and we don't have any real understanding of why she does this or how she does this, she is named king. And the weird thing about it is there's already a king on the throne. So she's named king at the same time that there's another kid on, on the throne. There's, there's now two kings on the throne and she's got to make, she's got to make this work. Why she was crowned is one of the most confusing and difficult things that, that we have to work with because this is an authoritarian state. This isn't like Greece or Rome that reveals its realpolitik and letters of Cicero talking about how horrible Mark Antony is or whatever. They're keeping it all perfected and idealized. And she only tells us that the god Amun Re, who was crowning her here, asked her to take on this power, that her father, Tutmos I, asked this of her. Otherwise, she's not doing this on her own accord. She is not uh, ambitious, she tells us. She's just doing these things to, to help her people. But was the entourage of Tutmos III pushing back in such a way that the stakeholders surrounding her were like, you gotta lock this down. We have to all lock this down. Regardless of what the reasons, she is now king alongside another king. And she will have these two depicted, herself and Tutmos III, almost as twins in some places. Same body, same masculinity, same kingship in every way. They are the same person she is presenting to everyone. There is no competition involved here. And Hatshepsut presents herself as the most idealized of the idealized. She is a jobs creator par excellence. She situates herself as the one in complete control of the money. She is the chief priestess, so she's obviously in control of the temple. She leads these great expeditions, which she doesn't lead them personally, but she sends them off to places like Eritrea or Somalia. We don't know exactly where they are. And they come back bearing incense trees, roots and all having communed with the chieftainess of Punt and they're bringing back all of these beautiful things. She builds extraordinary structures, some of which can still be seen today by tourists who visit Egypt. And yet she could not make the kingship fit her. She had to fit the kingship. And you can see this in her statuary. So she starts out trying to be like Nefru Sobek, the female king, wearing the dress, being the woman and, and having the kingship nonetheless. This doesn't quite work. So she, she goes a more ambivalent uh, route, showing herself as male and female at the same time. She's got herself here uh, wearing no shirt at all, and yet hints of her breasts are there. And it seems as if her breasts are bound because there are no nipples shown, as you would see on an Egyptian king's naked chest. You can't see that on her breasts. So she has no shirt on, but she does, and it's, it's unclear. Is she male? Is she female? The, the situation is complicated for her, and you can see a struggle in how do I represent myself to my people? How do I claim power? How can I be an elderly female who is ever growing more invisible as my nephew gains in power? He's getting stronger. He's getting taller. How do I keep my power with him growing up alongside me? until eventually the decision is made to just go all in and say, fine, I'm just going to depict myself as a man. I'm going to put on my 1990s pantsuit with the, with the <laughs> shoulder pads and put on my blocky heels and put the hair back and just, you know, masculinize as much as possible. And that's what she ends up doing, showing herself with a fully buff body, with a strong jaw, so that she looks like a man as much as she did in the two-dimensional relief I showed you before. So, she presents herself as doing everything perfectly. Everything, she does everything as she should. Amun Ray is given obelisks and temples. She is a great builder. She leaves Egypt better than she found it. And she is buried in state as a king by her nephew, Tutmos III, whom you see here. And it's not until 20 to 30, 20 to 25 years later that Tutmos III decides, I need to go after her. When he puts his son, Amenhotep II, on the throne, he starts to order her names be chiseled out where they were inscribed in temple spaces. He orders her statuary to be sledgehammered into small little tiny bits. Every statue of Hatshepsut that I've shown you has been glued back together carefully as they can 
with the pieces that were found by conservators in uh, museums from Cairo to Leiden to New York. And these, these elements of destruction show you that pattern holds, that a woman is useful as a placeholder in the moment. But as time goes on, as the generations go on, she has to be swept aside. She's not something that can be remembered. She's, she's a problem in the, in the long term, though she's useful in the here and now. So Hatshepsut is erased very much as Mernaith before her was erased. Now we're moving on to Nefertiti. And Nefertiti is a, a female king whose story is very much being written by Egyptologists as we speak. And her story is a very complicated one. And I won't be able to go into, I, one could write a whole book about Nefertiti, particularly with the archeology span that's happening right now. The title of the chapter that I write for Nefertiti also of Dynasty 18 is more than just a pretty face because most of you probably think of Nefertiti and, oh wait, I'm gonna skip, sorry. You think of Nefertiti and you think of this bust in Berlin and you think of her as this a paragon of beauty and virtue married to her husband, Amenhotep IV here. And she's much more, she ends up being a decision maker alongside her husband as a co-king and then she becomes a king in her own right many think and i think as well after his death so how does all of this come about well amenhotep the fourth was a very interesting king at the end of the 18th dynasty who started looking like this very orthodox very traditional and ended up having himself depicted like this male and female at the same time animal and human at the same time a prognathic and pulled face that is meant to react with the sunlight. And he changes Egyptians, Egyptian religion into something that is worshiping the sun in open air temples. And Nefertiti, his great royal wife depicted here, it, she receives the same treatment of her face. Her face is distorted and cold and all of these things that the sun touches make them have a, a different look to their persons and to their, their bodies and features. Um, I'm, again, I'm having a hard time moving my slides. We will try again. Come on, Nefertiti. There we go. And here we see Akhenaten because he now renames himself from Amenhotep IV to Akhenaten. And you may, many of you may or may be like, oh, I know who she's talking about now. And you see the sun disc up in the heaven and he is worshiping that sun disc and offering all of these foods to that sun disc, bathing in its rays. Nefertiti is a part of this journey with him. And when he moves his capital city to Akhenaten, as if king and city are the same, Akhenaten, Akhenaten, she goes with him. She, she accompanies him on this journey where he is going to build all of these open air temples and build a capital city from scratch in less than 12 years. Nefertiti's thoughts and ambitions are not known to us in this authoritarian state. We don't have any diaries, we don't have any letters, we don't have any of her innermost thoughts but she's there alongside this guy, Akhenaten, who is doing some of the craziest things that Egypt had ever seen before. And at a certain point, when they move to this new capital city, she receives a new name. And that new name is Nefer Nefru Aten Nefertiti. So it's a long one, but just wait, it's, it's gonna get a lot worse. So a new name for a new queen, new name for a new religion. Um, she's coming along with him in this this beautiful idealized portrait of family togetherness in which they're both being bathed by the sun's rays. They only show their daughters. Um, it, this looks like a very sweet and loving family scene until you realize that Akhenaten elevated two of those daughters to the role of great royal wife and had children with two of those daughters. For an Egyptologist who knows what it means to show a kiss on the lips to see this, this is a very sexualized image for us. We look at this and we go, oh my God, this is just shocking. And it, it is, it still shocks me to <laughs> look at this image. But this is the world, almost a cultish world, you can tell that Nefertiti is a part of. And a world with so many changes, so quick and fast upon each other's heels that Akhenaten is openly bribing and showing himself openly bribing his elites as he leans out of his window appearances and, and throws all of these solid gold trinkets to his, to his people. And many of the people who follow him to this new capital city are not the same people that were in the cities of Heliopolis or Memphis or Thebes before. He's elevating new men to new positions of power, many of them from the military. So this goes along with our, 
our ideas of a, of a cult, some sort of um, quick authoritarian changes happening, happening fast in succession to one another. And the work that's happening bioarchaeologically is stunning. And it shows that this king was working people, men, women, and children, too hard and too fast. And a number of graveyards have been found of people who were working wounded, working with broken legs, working malnourished, working in, in slave camp-like conditions, that this seems to be how this capital city was built so quickly. So this is the demanding king that we're talking about. And Nefertiti is alongside this man. And it's at this time that she becomes his co-king. Extraordinary, I told you women to come into power when there is a crisis of some kind. Well, maybe the crisis is self-imposed, self-made. Akhenaten somehow decides she's the only one he can trust. Again, we don't know the details. This authoritarian regime is going to clean everything up for us and idealize it. But we see that Nefertiti is king alongside him and she keeps one part of her name, that new element, that Nefer Nefru Aten. So her new name is co-king. And I would say most Egyptologists agree that she is co-king alongside is Ankh Hepru Re Nefer Nefru Aten, quite the mouthful, yes? That won't be her last name change. This name of Ankh Hepru Re has been identified by Egyptologists like Nicholas Reeves um, and, and others, corroborated by others, underneath the mask of Neb Hepru Re Tutankhamen on his funerary mask and on his coffins. So you can even ask yourself if this mask of Tutankhamen was originally for Nefertiti. Um, so how cool is it to see this mask and to think that that could be Nefertiti herself? Um, and, and that's what this slide is for. Um, now Nefertiti is going to receive another name change if I can get to my next slide in our pandemic. Uh, I wanna skip this one too. There we go. Um, so there is a really interesting ending to this story, which is that Nefertiti may actually have become sole king after the death of Akhenaten. And instead of keeping the Nefer Neferuaten element, she keeps the Ankh Hepru Re element. And for those of you that are really interested in conspiracy theories from ancient Egypt, you can now Google Nicholas Reeves, the tomb of Nefertiti, and you can look at all of the, the discussions amongst Egyptologists about whether Nefertiti herself as king, as Smenkare, Ankh Hepru Re Smenkare, was buried behind the back wall of Tutankhamen, or reversely said whether Tutankhamen was buried in the front foyer of her tomb in the Valley of the Kings as sole king. And now, just to wrap all of this up, and though we didn't get to Cleopatra, we can mention her in the Q&A, it seems that the patterns are clear that a woman can come to power to save a family dynasty when there is a crisis, when something goes wrong, but then the Egyptians do such a good job of making sure that it's all about the idealism of the patriarchy that they erase these women in these positions of power so that we're trying to resurrect them. We're trying to learn how to pronounce Hatshepsut's name. We're learning how to, we're figuring out what Nefertiti actually was. Was she a co-king? Was she a soul king? That if they take this power, these women have to erase the women that they were and become something completely different. And I will stop there and, and allow um, questions. Thank you, guys.